In the heady days of Canada's westward expansion, European settlers braved great hardships to build new lives on Canada's vast western prairies. To survive, they needed courage, resourcefulness, and no small amount of resilience. One pioneer in particular had all these qualities in spades. This is the story of Arthur Douglas Gregson, the first European settler in the area that would become home to the town of Black Falls, Alberta. Gregson came from England and strove to build a home for himself and his family in the unforgiving prairie climate. This is a tale of innovation, adventure, and kindness. Over 130 years later, the people who live in the prairies have not forgotten him. Arthur Douglas Gregson was born in Kent in 1864, the son of Jesse and Harriet. He was one of the youngest of 11 children, though only nine survived childhood, seven boys and two girls. His father was a farmer, and the family spent many years living in different locations in Kent, England, before moving in 1881 to Islington in London. Despite Arthur's relatively humble beginnings, the Gregson family has roots that went back almost a thousand years to John de Normantin, a close relative and supporter of William of Normandy, or as we often call him today, William the Conqueror. William forever altered the course of British history by sailing a fleet across the English Channel in 1066, and then defeating the Anglo-Saxon army at the epic Battle of Hastings. He became ruler of England and Normandy and imposed high feudalism upon the British Isles. William granted lands to one of his vassals, John, in gratitude for his services to him. This inherited wealth carried the family through the centuries. Moore House, located in Hawkehurst, Kent, was the seat for Jesse Gregson Esquire from 1810 to 1816, when he sold it to Admiral Lord Collingwood's daughter and her husband. The house was a 12,000 square foot mansion, which still stands today and has been, in its time, a hotel, a private school, and the residence of scientists and lords. After selling this house, the Gregson family moved to the nearby Great Wigsell Manor. Arthur Gregson, the protagonist of our story, was himself born into relative wealth in the Glindley Manor in Sussex. The nine Gregson children went on to live diverse lives. Arthur's oldest brother, Jesse, became a vicar. Alfred became a steward for Queen Victoria's Crown Estate and Barton Manor on the Isle of Wight. Herbert was a naval engineer, and Percy, a solicitor and notary. And Arthur became a Canadian pioneer in the wilderness of Alberta. Three of his other siblings also came to live with him around Black Falls during his long life there. Two brothers and his sister, Margaret, who traveled there with her children after her husband, James Pennington Burns, died of tuberculosis in 1905. As we will see, the disease tuberculosis is a bit of an unfortunate thread running through the Gregson story. Arthur grew up in Tunbridge Wells, where he went to school 20 miles from Down House, where Charles Darwin lived and worked at the time. We can tell that he developed an early interest in natural history, as he won a school prize for the best collection of moths and butterflies. Despite this passion, at the age of 15, he entered into a 10-year apprenticeship at the London Stock Exchange. When it was completed, he was made a member of the firm. Arthur's banking career, however, was to be short-lived. It was cut short by the same malady that would claim so many members of his family, at 25, he was diagnosed with tuberculosis. His doctor told him that if he didn't leave London for better climates, he would be dead within six months. With this sentence hanging over his head, he did what any English banker would do in this situation. He took an extended convalescence in Switzerland. He spent six months touring the countryside, taking leisure and photographing the stunning alpine scenery. At the end of this sojourn, he found himself alive and in much improved health. The climate had been good to him, and he decided not to risk the malodorous British climate again. Instead, 
He sought out a permanent home that had a similar climate to the Swiss cantons, but fell under the sway of the Union Jack. He chose Canada. In 1890, he sailed from Montreal, and from there took the recently completed Canadian Pacific Railway to Alberta. In those days, it was known as the Northwest Territory. Disembarking in Calgary, he purchased a team of horses that had been used in the Riel Rebellion, a Democrat wagon, and enough supplies to keep him alive for some time. Then, Arthur struck north across the prairie, seeking a new home. He quickly realized he'd underestimated the challenges of life on the prairie. For an English banker, the lack of hired help meant a steep learning curve. At his first stop, he removed his horse's harnesses by undoing every buckle, and then couldn't figure out how to put it all back together again the next morning. The tall leather boots he had purchased also baffled him. He could not figure out how to remove them for four days straight. Vexed by his ridiculous situation, he only figured out how to take his boots off when a nine-year-old girl showed him how to place his heel between the spokes of his wagon and pull. He remained undeterred and continued his trek across the bald prairie. Eventually, he entered a lush river valley and knew he'd found his new home. It was at the fork of the Red Deer and Blindman rivers, and he set up his tent and went about building a sod cabin, which must have been an interesting learning experience for him. He was the first pioneer in the area and applied for a homestead acreage near what is today known as Burbank, about two kilometers southeast of what would become Black Falls. Black Falls would only be founded 10 years later. He began breaking his land a few acres at a time. He bought horses, sheep, cattle, and pigs, and set about establishing a farm. Gradually, Arthur grew accustomed to the pioneer lifestyle and became strong, healthy, and lean. It was later said that he merely had to wiggle a six-foot crowbar into the thick prairie sod to make a fence post hole. At six foot two, he cut an impressive figure. Mary Shaw, another Black Falls area pioneer, wrote of arriving there as a child, quote, with long flowing hair and bare feet dangling below the belly of an Indian pony, Gregson was anything but a reassuring sight to us four small girls. Along with tending to livestock, building his house, and clearing his land, Arthur learned to hunt and trap. He did very well in those early years. Beaver, muskrat, coyote, fox, marten, and link were everywhere in abundance. He even trapped a bear at Snake Lake, now known as Sylvan Lake. Not even an axe wound to the leg could stop him from building his home. Though this injury laid him up for nearly three months, he soon recovered. As the years went on, Arthur became more and more settled and was ready to move beyond his sod house. In 1900, he began the construction of a 24 by 36 foot house built of rocks brought up from the river bank. His friends and neighbors who had come to settle around him helped him in the construction. The house, which was partly built into the hillside, was completed in 1905. Arthur wanted a medieval style home reminiscent of those from his childhood in England. So he built the house with foot thick stone walls and a great hall with a massive fireplace at one end. He called it La Maison Roche, translated as the Rock House. And he continued to add improvements as the years went by. He even added a stone tower with turrets in 1917, along with a second set of north and south gable ends on the second floor. True to the spirit of English wealth, Arthur filled the house with parties and feasts. He was known for holding banquets with his friends, which would last whole weekends. Arthur didn't live alone among the wilderness for long. Just a year after he arrived in Black Falls, in 1891, his brother Percy joined him and did not return to England until 1907. More of his family also joined him in 1905 after the completion of his new house. Another brother, George Leopold, and his sister Margaret, along with some of their children, settled in Black Falls. His mother also came to live with him, as her husband, Arthur's father, had died at the age of 80 in 1902. Harriet lived at Black Falls until her death in 1914. Many of these relatives had come to Canada for the same reason as Arthur, 
they were struggling with tuberculosis and seeking a better climate. Cleaner air was the most common prescription for the disease in those days. Several of Margaret's five children, Arthur's nieces and nephews, also contracted the disease. Margaret went back to England twice in the following years when her children were dying. Ultimately, she too settled in Canada, passing away in Victoria, BC in 1938. For Arthur's oldest niece, Barbara, even the climate of Alberta was not enough to halt her tuberculosis, and she moved to Switzerland instead. Unfortunately, that didn't help either, and she died there in 1912 at the age of 30. Margaret's only son, Geoffrey, also struggled with the disease. He lived in the Black Falls area for a number of years before returning to England in 1930, where, tragically, he too died young. Of Margaret's other children, only one settled permanently in Alberta. Cicely married Herbert Elwell in 1913 and lived on a dairy farm with her three children in Burbank, near Arthur's homestead. Margaret's other daughters eventually left Alberta. Marjorie moved back to England and married there, while Brenda moved to New Zealand, where she got married, had a daughter, and tragically died soon after from a fall from a horse. However, while Margaret's family was living in Alberta, Arthur paid them every care. He built a separate sanatorium on this property so that those suffering from the disease could live in comfort without the risk of infecting their healthy family members. Likely, Arthur's own experience with the disease made him acutely sensitive to its dangers and its discomforts. And Arthur was equally attentive to his healthy relatives. When two of his nieces, Marjorie and Brenda, expressed a desire to experience the great outdoors of the Wild West, Arthur promised to take them on a hunting and trapping expedition in the Rockies. Marjorie and Brenda were then rambunctious and adventurous teenagers, aged 17 and 15. Brenda preferred to sleep outside under the stars with just a blanket rather than the house her uncle had built. Both girls were anxious to obtain the furs of mountain sheep and deer, and to camp in the mountains. The trip would turn out to be more of an adventure than even the girls had bargained for. Gregson's generous longtime friend, James Brewster of Banff, the Mountain Millionaire as he was known, provided the party with pack horses. They left from Banff and headed nearly 90 miles north, camping in the Yahatinda area. Unfortunately, that year, there was an early and exceedingly heavy snowfall. When the group headed for home, they found the way they had come blocked by deep drifts of snow. It was unpassable. The three were trapped in the Rockies for a long, hard winter. What were they to do? Well, these were no slouches. They immediately set about building a cabin with a crude rock fireplace to live in until the snow melted in the spring. Their stock of groceries soon ran out, and they had to live instead off the land. The trio managed to hunt and trap ptarmigan, deer, mountain sheep, porcupine, grouse, and squirrels. The girls also caught trout with hooks made from their hairpins. They even saved enough squirrel skins to make a nice wrap. Most of their days were spent outdoors hunting. Yet even the food they did have was in danger when they left it unsupervised at their cabin. Their supply of rice mysteriously vanished, and the girls later discovered that the culprit was a pocket gopher who would fill its cheeks with their precious rations and escape to its own pantry under the rocks. Following the gopher's tracks in the snow, the girls tracked down the thief and took back what was theirs. Food was not always easy to come by, and some days would go by where they would catch or trap nothing. During one of these hungry periods, Arthur came across the recent kill of a cougar, a buck deer. He was able to carve off a hindquarter from what was left, and the meat kept them all fed for quite some time. On another day, Marjorie returned from checking her trap lines with a beautiful lynx over her shoulder. Hunting wasn't always easy though, and it got Arthur into some dangerous situations. During one memorable hunt, he was tracking a mountain sheep and ended up climbing too high up the cliffs all the way to the crest of a mountain. Rather than taking the long trail back down again, Arthur decided to slide straight down the slope towards the cabin. 
In the process, he triggered a small avalanche and found himself riding down the mountain on a detached mass of snow. Despite his terror, the snow carried him safely to the base of the mountain, within a short distance of camp. The girls did not believe this story, but when they went out the next morning, they saw the mark of his descent plainly visible. Along with food, clothing was in short supply that winter. The girls were forced to sew new clothes from empty flour and rice sacks, a resourceful tactic that would one day be used all over the country during the lean times of the Great Depression. The family celebrated both Christmas and New Year's in their cabin, though they later found out that they were four days off in their calculations of the date. Spring finally came, and the three trudged out of the wilderness together, with some furs and skins as souvenirs. Their family was no doubt thrilled and relieved to see them after such a long winter with no news and no way to send out a search party. The borrowed ponies, which had spent the winter feeding on the grass beneath the snow, were also returned in good shape. All of this time in the Alberta wilderness allowed Arthur to pursue a childhood passion of his, natural history and science. Freed from the constraints of the London Stock Exchange in his new home, he devoted himself to the collection and study of insects, with a particular focus on fleas, harvesting the bugs from the pelts of animals he had killed. He once shot a bear and, thinking it was dead, made a trip home to grab his flea collecting equipment. He then lay a white sheet on the fur of the bear to make the fleas easier to see and sat on the animal to begin collecting. This would have worked quite well if the bear had not suddenly come to life and jumped up again. Arthur made a quick retreat back to his house for his gun, but the, by the time he returned to the site, the bear, and his coveted fleas, had vanished. The fleas and insects Arthur collected were of great interest to natural scientists back in the United Kingdom, and they were eager buyers. He purchased specimens from trappers and naturalists all over the world, and had a massive flea collection that is now part of the British Museum. Flea collecting might seem like a niche interest to us today, but it was actually an enormously popular pastime back in those days. A six-volume set of books was published entitled An Illustrated Catalogue of the Rothschild's Collection of Fleas. Just one of these tomes ran to 560 pages in length. Arthur himself must have made many contributions to it as he was one of the Baron Rothschild's best flea collectors. Over the course of his time collecting, he set the Rothschild's 87 individual fleas and 12 different species, several of which were newly discovered. In Blackfalds, Arthur wasn't alone in his passion for natural history. There were lots of amateur zoologists, botanists, and entomologists among the early settlers, and not a few within Arthur's own family. His brother Percy also got in on the game, selling his own fleas to the Rothschilds. His nieces, Marjorie and Brenda, made $60 from the fleas they collected during their winter trapped in the mountains. They spent the money buying new saddles. Selling samples wasn't enough for the Gregsons, however. One of the first natural history museums in Western Canada was founded in Percy Gregson's home in Blackfalds and he was also the founding president of the Northwest Territorial Entomological Society. The society was founded in 1898 at Percy's first homestead, next to his brother Arthur's. Its objective was to study the insects and plants of the Northwest Territories, including not only the useful and the beautiful, but also the pests and the weeds that were so ruinous to agriculture. Arthur, was the secretary treasurer, while Percy served as a librarian and curator of the collection. Other early members included Bishop Pinkham, Dr. Henry George, Frederick H. Wally Dodd, and Dr. Fletcher, who was a government entomologist in Ottawa. The museum included about 700 beetle samples, 400 butterflies and moss, and a wide array of other insects and a collection of local plants, weeds, seeds, and fossils. With the Gregsons at its heart, the society flourished. Percy was appointed the local inspector of noxious weeds, 
He also delivered several talks, addressing members at annual meetings and other gatherings. At a meeting in Calgary in February 1902, Percy Gregson and Frederick Wally Dodd gave entomological lectures accompanied by magic lantern slides, which went over extremely well with a large crowd. Meetings of the Society were at first held at Percy's home in Black Falls, and the surrounding flower gardens were often the site of Society picnics. Percy moved into the village of Blackfalds in 1903, but remained president of the society for two more years when Dr. Henry George took over. It was that year that the Northwest Territory became the provinces of Alberta and Saskatchewan. So it was only fitting the society be renamed the Alberta Natural History Society. The name also reflected its expanding remit, which went from insects and weeds to all flora, fauna, geology, and paleontology. The new president, Dr. George, called Percy Gregson one of the best entomologists in all Alberta. Even after Percy returned to England in 1907, the Natural History Society continued strong. They held a contest for the best collection of wildflowers in 1914, which was won by Everett Hill of Blackfalls. The Society's members found many incredible specimens over the years, and the region even gained the joking accolade of the flea capital of the world. An extremely rare Xylena capaz moth was discovered in 1915 in Blackfalls, according to the notes of Mr. F. Whitehouse. In 1919, the aspen leaf roller and black army cutworm were collected in large numbers. Arthur was noted to have found the first black swallowtail butterfly in the area. And the Strickland Museum in Edmonton also has records of several checkered white butterfly samples collected by him in 1919. Today, the society Percy founded is still going strong under the name the Red Deer River Naturalists. Margaret Gregson's only son, Jeffrey, was also passionate about natural history while he lived in Black Falls. He created his own small natural history museum at his house just east of Burbank. The cabin, originally built by John Tipping and called the Tipping Stopping House, was crowded with musical instruments, furs, and natural history specimens. Jeffrey received an old microscope and a custom-made wooden insect cabinet from his uncle, Dr. Herbert Cronk in England. Unfortunately, Jeffrey suffered from tuberculosis and had to be looked after by his sister, Cicely. Over the years, his health deteriorated and he traveled back to England in 1930 with his mother, where he died later that year. He bequeathed both microscope and insect cabinet to his cousin, Jack Gregson. Both are now on display in the Black Falls Historical Society's Gregson exhibit. Despite the tragedies that befell many of his blood relations, Arthur Gregson built a family in Black Falls. In 1907, he married Eddie Kellaway on October 10th. Three years later, they had a son, Jack Douglas. As all this was going on, the settlement of Black Falls continued to grow, and Arthur played no small part in that development. He was made a Justice of the Peace for the Northwest Territories in 1897, and remained in that position for many years. The Gregsons also helped construct many of the buildings in the town. In those days, public buildings were often built with the volunteer labor of the townspeople, and Black Falls was no exception. St. Jude's Anglican Church was largely constructed this way, and around 50 people, including the Gregsons, attended a stone-hauling social in the early days of construction. The crowd spent the day gathering stones for the church's foundation and ended the event with a large picnic under the trees. The church was funded almost entirely through the fundraising efforts of Harriet Gregson, Arthur's elderly mother. Percy Gregson was parish warden for the church, and Arthur was a member of the vestry. Other buildings in the town had the Gregsons to thank for their existence. The first public hall in Black Falls was built by Arthur's brother George in 1906, 
It later became the local ladies' aid hall when George sold it in 1936, and remained a place for social gatherings until it burned down some 10 years later. The town's creamery had Percy Gregson as its first secretary treasurer. Arthur later purchased the creamery, though it did not sustain itself as it previously had. It wasn't only buildings that the Gregsons helped to create in Blackfalls, but public infrastructure as well. In 1904, Arthur donated land at Burbank to the Blindman Power Company so that he could construct a hydroelectric dam on the Blindman River, just upstream from where it runs into the Red Deer River. The goal was to provide power to nearby Lacombe, with the transmission lines running from the dam all the way up north. The heavy work of construction took nearly two years and, unfortunately, ended up lasting less than a decade. In winter, and in other times of low flow, it couldn't meet the power demands of Lacombe. In addition, the transmission lines were laid through swampy ground. With the constant freezing and thawing of the muskeg, the power poles teetered at crazy angles and had a tendency to topple over, causing power outages that took a long time to fix. An auxiliary plant ended up being built in Lacombe to compensate for these disruptions. By 1909, the town of Lacombe bought out that project and came to rely on the auxiliary plant for all their electricity. The dam was abandoned in 1912, left in a state of neglect. It was swept away soon after by a particularly heavy spring runoff. A Canadian National Railway right-of-way and siding was also built near the Gregson Farm. Construction started in 1911 and the company used a large steam shovel for their work. The fill was loaded onto rail cars and moved down the tracks half a mile, where it was then used in the construction of a large wooden trestle that was to stretch over the Blindman River. Large crews of workmen stayed in the area during construction, and about a hundred men lived in camps at Blackfalls. Both projects finished successfully. The trestle was so long that little platforms had to be built along the sides, in case someone was walking across it when a train came along and they didn't have enough time to make it to the other side. After many long years living in Blackfalls with his family, Arthur Gregson finally moved away in 1923. Once again, he was looking for a better climate, this time for somewhere warmer. He purchased five acres of land on Vancouver Island in 1922, between Courtney and Comox, and built a house there with the help of a local handyman. He and his family made the move a year later, leaving behind everything they had built in Black Falls since 1890. On the West Coast, Arthur and Eddie's son Jack flourished, and both he and Arthur continued their studies of natural history. Jack graduated from UBC with honors in 1934 and went on to get a master's in medical entomology from the University of Alberta in 1936. Now a grown man, he moved to Kamloops later that year, where he met and married Barbara Claxton. The couple built their own home on the land beside the Thompson River and had five children together. On July 16th, 1936, Arthur Gregson passed away at the age of 72 after a long and fulfilling life in Canada. His wife, Eddie, moved in with her son, Jack, at his new home in Kamloops, where she lived until her death. Jack, for his part, went on to have a long career with the Canadian Department of Agriculture in Kamloops, where he specialized in ticks. He was recognized globally for his scientific contributions to tick-borne diseases and was the author of over 80 publications. Jack continued his father's love of insects and had many new species of ticks named after him, as well as one species of flea, which he collected in Alaska, the Gregsoni. Jack and his wife Barb lived for many years in Kamloops. Jack was a true naturalist and environmentalist. He founded the Kamloops Outdoors Club, which lasted for many decades and organized hundreds of mountain hikes and photography trips. He was also a gifted painter, and he had showings of his work at both the Vancouver and Kamloops art galleries. 
He was the recipient of many awards for both his academic accomplishments and the beautiful gardens he tended to on his property in Kamloops. Jack died in 2006 at the age of 96. His wife Barb lived another five years and passed away at 95. Despite the passing of many generations, the Gregsons still remain drawn to the area around Black Falls and the home that for many decades stood at the center of Arthur's life. Arthur's grandson John visited Black Falls only a few years ago and took a tour of the places nearby that his grandfather had once loved. Many other Gregson family members have also made pilgrimages to the area from as far afield as Australia and California. Gone is the stone house, which was Arthur's pride and joy, torn down sometime in the 1970s. One of the original Gregson barns still stands, along with Geoffrey Burns's beloved log cabin, long emptied of his many specimens of natural history. The Gregson barn now sits in the rural subdivision at Burbank, on a property that recently sold for over a million dollars. In 1966, Arthur's son Jack returned to his old home for the first time in 43 years. His diary entry for that day captures the strange changes which time had wrought. Quote, My first return in 43 years, then to try to find our old home. All was unrecognizable, until I found eastern landmarks, then recognized my old muskeg. The road had been rerouted. Finally found the stone house buried in Manitoba maples, deserted but intact and much shrunken, as were all the hills and distances. Nothing resembled my memories of the place, and it was like opening a coffin and expecting to find one as he had known them. I still have my original memories, to which the recent are alien and separate." End quote. Even though over a century has passed since the Gregson family first set foot in the area we know today as Blackfelds, the people who live there today still remember them. The Blackfelds and Area Historical Society has an entire exhibit dedicated to the family, sharing their stories with visitors and locals alike. Museum guests to the Wadey House Visitor Center can see many of the artifacts that shaped the lives of the Gregson family and we encourage you to pay a visit.